Hello and welcome to ATP Report. We are very honored and thrilled to have a very special guest with us back today. Dr. Bill Warner is the founder of the Center for Study of Political Islam and based on decades of research is here to announce a new movement that he is developing. Welcome, Dr. Bill. My goodness, Barry, it sounds like we should have had a drum roll. <laughs> or at least a marching band. <laughs> right. So we've been talking before we went on air, Dr. Bill. Tell us about what you're developing and why it's so important today. Well, I was talking with one of my students in Central Europe, and she was saying that it was difficult for them to get in to see the right people, but that Muslims could go see these right people. These are government officials anytime they wanted to. And I says, well, if they'll let Muslims come in to see them, what about former Muslims? idea a light bulb goes on in my head and she says, well, I've never heard of that. I says, I've never heard of it either. But I said, it's a question that needs to be asked. I already knew what the fate of the apostate was from my study of Islam, and it is not good. It's well, let's, let's start with that, Bill. Why is being an apostate from Islam so dangerous and sometimes um, to the point of your family, your life, your job, your integration or lack thereof in society, it, it's like you committed mass murder, but you didn't kill anybody. Can you explain? Actually, it's worse than mass murder because being an apostate is the worst sin of all. And this goes back to the days of, guess what, Muhammad and Allah. The Quran says that those who leave Islam can be killed and there are several hadith, those little short stories about Muhammad who also say that apostates can be killed as a matter of fact, should be killed. So the reason that apostates can be killed is Allah, Allah says so and so does Muhammad. Now when Muhammad died, the first caliph that is ruler of Islam was Abu Bakr. Abu Bakr's first business was not to preach more about Islam but instead to declare war against those who wanted to leave Islam because many of the Muslims said, well, you know, we had a deal with Muhammad. It was good while it lasted, but we're out of here. He said, nope, you're not leaving. And if you try to, I'll kill you. These were known as the Rita Wars, the apostasy wars. So that's how Islam started out was killing apostates. That was his first foreign policy. That is, it declared that the, anybody who was a apostate was a foreigner and could be killed. Because it creates, it's worse, considered the worst crime because it creates chaos within the community. One of the great, one of the sheikhs from Al Azhar University said, listen to this, if it were not for the apostasy laws, Islam would cease to exist. How important is that? Well, that tells you, it's like the Hotel California song by the Eagles. You can check in, but you can't check out. It's a one way mousetrap. It is indeed. You can check out anytime you want, but you can never leave. <laughs> So what's historically so unusual about Islam today? Well, we're at a unique time in history. I love to study history and one of the way we're living in an important time. This is the first time in 1400 years that the common man, the ordinary man, the bus, bus driver, the plumber can read and understand Islamic doctrine. This was always under the purvey of serious scholars, but now then anybody can do it. The other thing is for the first time in history, apostates, Former Muslims are speaking out in a public way. Here's, here's Annie Cyrus. So there are many others. I've done two interviews recently with other women who are left Islam and they're anxious to speak to the world. So these two new things that anyone can understand the doctrine. When I say that the apostates should be killed, you can go read it yourself in the Hadith and the Quran. And so anyone can learn this and anyone can see what the fate of the apostate is. And I don't know of anybody, even my most liberal friends, who would say, ah, kill the apostates. That just wouldn't happen. So it's an important I mean, thing. When you say the words, it sounds like you're, you're a crazy man. I mean, truly crazy. And yet we both know what you're saying is 100% true and accurate around the world. It's happening right now uh, in most major countries, East and West. So. Why are we losing our war against political Islam? And what could ex-Muslims do, as you call it, to be a secret weapon? Well, they're a secret weapon because of this. When I say something about Islam, you can always say, oh, Bill doesn't know anything. He's a, 
crazy old professor. You have to be a Muslim to know Islam. As a matter of fact, if you're not a Muslim, it's proof that you don't understand Islam. The argument goes, if you reject Islam, then you don't understand it. It's because it's the most perfect way of life. So there we have that. Well, in, in today's world, ex-Muslims, um, as you said, are the enemy and carrying on the tradition from 1500 years ago, they are the worst enemies. How are ex-Muslims being treated today in the US and Europe? Basically ignored. Well, let's take for an example, the FBI. The FBI hires Arab translators and Farsi translators, but they never hire former Muslim translators. As a matter of fact, they wouldn't even ex accept anybody but a Muslim. So that's how they're treated, they're ignored. But in my opinion, who knows Islam the best? Me? No, an apostate knows it best because they've been both in the Kafir world and they've been in the Muslim world. So they're the ones that you should be doing the translation for the FBI and CIA and, and NSA. There are other jobs like this. Let me give you an example of how it's not done and how it should be done. Here in Tennessee, we got a new governor who called himself a conservative and he needed to train the state law enforcement. Did he turn to me? Nope. Did he turn to anybody but the Muslim Brotherhood? So the Muslim Brotherhood appeared in front of law enforcement and basically said, Islam is a religion of peace. These people who are Muslims who do bad things, they're not really Muslims, blah, blah, blah. Fine, let them say that. But what should come after that is a former Muslim should stand up and say their view of Islam. So therefore law enforcement gets to hear not only the believer side, but the doubter side as well. That is, they will understand the whole picture. And so that's very important because I've discovered that anybody when they hear the whole story and can believe it, they reject it. Well, you know, it reminds me when I just listened to you about the governor in Tennessee, um, after 9-11 bill, uh, after very devout religious Muslims uh, carried out the most horrific terror attack in American history on American soil. President George Bush for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks was making the speech, religion of peace. Islam is a religion of peace. The hijackers were not true Muslims and on and on and on. As if somebody gave him a different copy of the Quran that I had read and you have read, which told them the hijackers, that what they did was perfect under the rules of the religion. So my question, I guess, is what do we do when all of these governments, and I mean from the very top in the White House, governors and so on, have this idea in their head that the only source of reliable information about the religion are the apologists for the religion. And anybody that's left that speaks out, well, they're Islamophobic, Bill. You're a racist, hater, bigot, Islamophobe. That's what you're called. <laughs> exactly. It, there, Islam is a strange idea in that only those who practice it can understand it. That's not true of the Democratic Party, the Republican Party, or, in, or Christianity or anything else. That is, don't, hey, look. The basis for Islam is Muhammad, and we, we have his biography, and don't tell me that I can't read a biography and understand it. I mean, just let's, let's be sane here. So there, but what happens is, is I have to overcome that barrier, whereas the former Muslim can't be told, oh, you don't understand Islam. So therefore, what's difficult is, see, I thought when you printed the truth that people would want to hear the truth, but that's just simply not the case. How naive. <laughs> I was very naive because what happened was the Muslim Brotherhood, when after 9-11, started spending money and getting appointments with public relations firms and other such people. So they went to see the governors. They went to see the senators. They went to see the, the congressmen. And when someone like me comes along, we can't get in the door. So the nice thing about a former Muslim is, is that they have to be believed because they know it. They were there. And they, therefore, they can be seen as truth tellers, even in the marketplace of ideas of the government. Well, Bill, I hope you're right. And this is the discussion that we're not going to solve today, but we're going to have you back. Thanks for coming on today. Glad and, to for all so. of, and all of you out there in ATP land that haven't yet subscribed, I want to remind you again, please take out your cell phone, text the word truth, T-R-U-T-H, and send it to the number 88202, push send you'll be automatically subscribed to our free text message alert system. You'll get all of our content like 
the brilliant Dr. Bill explaining Islam to you like today and everything else from the ATP family. For Dr. Bill Warner, I'm Barry Nussbaum. Thanks for joining us on ATP Report.